Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give, and there's no regular commitment. Just click the link in the show description to support now. Hey, book lovers. My name is Em, and I want to talk about books. And cats. Welcome back, book lovers. I want to jump right into this week's book because I'm kind of obsessed with it. Today, I want to talk about The Lies I Tell by Julie Clark. So this is my newest book of the month. I actually got it just the other day, and it arrived right on time. It showed up on my reading day. So I was supposed to do a readathon, as I told you guys, several weeks ago, and then ended up not being able to because my animals passed away. And I finally decided that I needed to take a day and just read and relax for my mental health, if nothing else. (laughs) So this book showed up right on time. And it was engaging right from the start. One thing that I love in the development of writing is that the more modern books have a much quicker dive into plot and action. I read a lot of older books, especially when I was younger you know, the quote-unquote classics, and they're fantastic, but they can be incredibly wordy. And I can appreciate the pictures that they paint with the words, but sometimes it's just too much. You know what I mean? And I know that a lot of those books were written at a time where, you know, you didn't have TV or anything, so you really did have to, like, paint the picture, and people had time for long, wordy descriptions. But not anymore. (laughs) The example I always like to use is The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. I'm sure most Americans have read it. I don't know about the rest of the world, but he's kind of required reading around here. And it was a great story, but you can literally skip every other chapter. Because it'll be like a chapter with some plot and character development, and then a chapter just describing the location. And it's beautiful, and I get it, like he is setting a very specific time and place in American history. It's very well done, but you can literally skip every other chapter and still get the story. That seems like, I don't know, overkill? But that's just my own personal opinion. I personally don't think that all of the description is necessary, But I also do understand that there are probably people that really love a lengthy description, and that's what they read the book for. I'm more of a plot, action, conversation kind of girl. And honestly, I just think it's harder now. You kind of really have to jump into things and catch people's attention because everyone has access to absolutely everything now. So if it doesn't catch their attention, they're just going to move on real quick. Anyway. The Lies I Tell by Julie Clark does jump right into things, and I was hooked right from the beginning. The narration is split between two women, Meg Williams, who has gone by many names in the past, and Kat Roberts, who is a failed reporter who's been following Meg for over a decade. So Meg is a con artist, and Kat has been trying to break the story, but she's never gotten close enough before. Then Meg disappeared for 10 years, and Kat's life took a turn for the worse. Like, real bad. Now Meg has resurfaced at a political fundraiser, and surprisingly under her own name, and working as a real estate agent. Kat gets the Google alert and immediately is drawn back into the past, and back into her obsession with finally getting back at Meg Williams. This time she adopts a new identity of her own in an attempt to get closer to Meg. This concerns her longtime boyfriend, Scott, who is a fraud investigator. He's worried that she's getting too close to a con woman, and he's also worried about her obsessive behavior, which is beginning to return. But Scott is also causing problems for Kat. He's got a gambling addiction that he did not tell her about until he managed to get her $15,000 in debt. He's been in therapy and seems to be doing well, and she's trying to help him through it and work on their relationship. 
But then things start to happen that make Kat doubt him and make her think that he's relapsed. She can't deny that Scott could also be right and that maybe Meg is framing him. She has no idea who to believe. And Meg is a mastermind. She chooses her victims very carefully. She prepares for years before taking action. And she only targets a certain type of man. The kind that never seems to suffer consequences for their horrid actions. We all know that type, right? Of those men, she chooses specific ones. Terrible ones who also will offer financial gain for Meg and closure for their victims. Because Meg does what she can to benefit the women who have suffered at the hands of these men. And this is where things in the book take a bit of a turn. Meg's a con artist, and that brings to mind certain things. You can form certain opinions about her just based on that information, and you wouldn't be wrong. But as she reveals her reasons and her past, you can also see her side of things. See how she became who she is now and why she does what she does. It's a really fascinating tale, and honestly, it really spoke to my little feminist soul, especially with all the crap that's going on in our country right now, where women are, uh, you know, not being treated as human beings and are being controlled. Um, this book was a nice um, salve for that anger. <laughs> it's really good. I absolutely loved The Lies I Tell by Julie Clark, and I definitely recommend that you check it out as well. So good. It was even better than I thought it would be, which is always an awesome surprise. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about my cats. Now, we always say that our house really belongs to the cats. They have their own special places just all over our house. We're adding new ones all the time. <laughs> my newest realization is that they also kind of have a playground. <laughs> They're both inside cats. But there is a room on the front of our house which has a cement floor. And I think it used to be like a closed off porch area or something. I don't know. But right now it's my weight room, a.k.a. my happy place. <laughs> And it's also the cat's happy place, because whenever I go out there to work out, they hurry after me, and they immediately go to their favorite areas. Weird loves a piece of gym flooring that we left when we took it all out. He likes to sit on it and just scratch like crazy. He does it with boxes and all things cardboard, too. <laughs> it's really funny. Sasser's has a certain corner of the cement floor that she likes to roll around on, it's the first thing she does every time she goes out there. She sprints out there and then just rolls and rolls and rolls, and then she climbs all over the place. We have a loft area for storage, and we actually put shelves on the wall so she could climb up. There's a hammock up there that we have no place to hang it up, and she's made a nest for herself. That actually started out as Strudel's place. Uh, she was a much calmer energy. <laughs> and would just come hang out with me while I worked out. She liked to be out there, but she just wanted to be up in her little nest, like, watching me. Weird and Sassers just like to play. And that's great, too. Good entertainment. They're so cute. <laughs> so here's a random question for you guys. It's mostly for my fellow writers. Does anyone else get spell-checked for using British English spellings? I do all the time, and I think it has to be because I read so many of those old classics as a teenager. But I just wonder how this has seeped into my brain so deeply, because it happens a lot. But then I guess I do love British art and comedy and writing and baking shows. Yeah, I'm just a nerd. But does anybody else get spell-checked for using British English? I always find it funny. Anyway, this week's quote of the week is about peace and about the wonderful and sad truth about bringing it into your life. And the quote is, Nobody can bring you peace but yourself. You gotta love Ralph Waldo Emerson. Honestly, I could use some time sitting out in nature right now. But I do have other ways of bringing peace into my life, like hanging out in the cat playground with my fur babies. <laughs> anyway, now we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I have a new chapter of Ocean Eyes. Be right back.
Welcome back, book lovers. So I'm still really digging this weekly writing project and book two of the Verdant Valley series, Ocean Eyes. And this week, I have chapter four for you. Enjoy. Yada moved through the dark woods silently. She'd spent her life perfecting this skill, and she kept off the well-worn trails when she walked alone. Yada felt safer amongst the trees and hidden in the shadows. The monsters didn't watch the shadows. She had stayed with Morena for several days, making plans that then seemed pointless or impossible. They made useless guesses at what Rhea had been there to share. It went unspoken that they both questioned Rhea's death now. Had it been her choice? The answer to that would change everything. Morena was stuck. Her cousin's death and the loss of the book was a double strike of grief. Fear swallowed everything else and she was frozen. Yada had seen something else as well, something she kept to herself. When Morena ran for the cliffside, Yada saw a monster. It was bigger than any she'd seen before, and it rose out of the ocean like a mountain. Somehow, Morena didn't see it. It almost got her. As she moved back towards Yada, the hazy apparition attached itself to Morena's back. It was pulling her back toward the cliff. Only Morena's incredible strength kept her moving forward. Yada grabbed her as soon as she could. She had known it could not touch her, though she had no idea how. It recoiled at her touch with a hiss and slithered back down into the ocean. A massive storm system halted over the beach for days. They had to shout over the crashing thunder as they tried to decide what to do next. It was almost impossible to think with the noise. The crackle of electricity when the lightning struck the ocean was terrifying. It made their hair lift and float in halos around their heads. Yada could feel a buzzing in her blood. She felt energized and needed to get out and walk. Finally, the storm let up, and she made a quick excuse about checking on her cottage, though she knew it was untouched. Nothing was the same on the other side of the trees. She paused for a moment now in the safety of the forest. She huddled in a small crevice under an overhang of shimmery gray rock. Her body was jittery, and she felt ill. She wrapped her arms around her knees and tried to be still. She felt the energy leave her body. It was absorbed into the rock beneath her, and a cool wave of safety washed over her. Yada leaned her head back against the stone and sighed with relief. She saw no monsters on her way to the village. Before today, she had only seen them amongst the trees. They had been there long before Morena came to the eastern shores. They had been here long before the village. Yada had seen them first as a child, when she was left in the woods to play by her father's new wife. In some ways, Yada feared the monsters less than people. They were simple and easy to avoid once she understood their habits. People were much more complicated. She could read their thoughts, but it didn't help her understand them any better. It was kind of horrifying to glimpse their thoughts. This new monster was something else altogether, something she had only seen mentioned once before. In the book. Morena didn't know she'd looked in it. The book was off limits. The older woman allowed Yada access to almost everything in her house. Only the book was absolutely forbidden. As if Yada would be able to ignore it after that. Her curiosity grew exponentially. Still, she managed to hold off for quite some time. It was just days after her 16th birthday when the call of the secret tome had finally become overwhelming. Morena had gone in search of a particular mushroom that grew deep in the shadowy, untrodden parts of the forest. She left Yada at the cliff house. A new spell was simmering on the stove, and someone needed to tend it. Yada was working her way through a new book of spells and potions, Morena's library was extensive. Books lined the walls of the cluttered cottage, and every corner was filled with perilous, teetering piles of books. In many places, books were an ancient rarity, an outdated tool far surpassed by quick magic and technology. Quick magic was all most people knew, spells to ease the turmoil and hardship of daily life. Most never looked for anything deeper. Magic was quaint and outdated, the peace tree had removed most magic from the valley, and it was now draining other places as well. Yada's village was far on the outskirts, and even they had recently felt a dip in power. Most barely noticed it, but Yada felt it keenly. Worry had formed a hard knot in her belly, and she was filled with dread. 
The book was in its usual place of prominence behind Marina's large desk. Amongst the overflowing shelves, the book sat on its own shelf alone. Otherwise, there was nothing special about it. No one looking at it would have any idea what world-shattering information was stored inside. Yada knew far more than she should. She had opened the book that day and just looked at the faded handwriting on the first page. The yellowed paper was speckled with small, brownish spots. Old blood. The dark-hearted ones only used blood magic. The sisters had been fully committed. They did everything right. Well, almost everything. Yada had most of the book committed to memory. She had read the entire thing first. Then she began working through it more diligently. She'd sneak a look whenever she could. Morena was rarely away from her home, and she spent a good deal of time in her study. She was also working her way through the book, looking intently at the spaces between the words, studying every tiny detail. Yada wasn't sure what Morena was looking for, but she did have a feeling that something was missing from the book. There shouldn't have been. The whole point of the Secret Keeper was to record the history of the dark-hearted ones, the sisters in particular, and bear the weight of their secrets, and keep them safe. It wouldn't make sense for the previous Secret Keeper to leave anything out, especially considering what she had chosen to include. She was even honest about her own involvement. Still, there was an emptiness. It was hidden and almost intangible, but Yada could feel it. One of her unfortunate talents. She knew many things, and she also felt the cavernous emptiness of missing things and things left unsaid. The shadows in the forest grew long. They shifted around her, and the sun sent golden strands slanting through the thin-needled trees. She suddenly knew she wasn't alone. The thought rippled through her like a shiver, and she froze in place while trying to keep her loose, unaware manner. Her eyes remained looking off nonchalantly into the trees, but her body sent out a searching wave of energy. Her eyes were fairly useless, but she still saw more than most. Her watcher was kneeling on a large outcropping of stone above her and to her left. She barely had time to register it before it screamed and leapt upon her back. Its claws sank into her shoulders and pierced her skin. Yada cried out and tried slamming her unseen foe into a tree. Her attacker grunted, and Yada felt their grip loosen just a little. Gathering every last ounce of strength that she possessed, Yada swung her body around with a low, echoing cry. The body of the thing on her back hit a nearby tree trunk with a dull thwack. Her attacker groaned, and the heavy weight slid from her back. Yada sprung away quickly, but she didn't need to. The huddled mass of clothes crumpled into a pile, and steam rose up. The sunlight glittered through it, turning the particles to gold. Then it was gone. Only the dirty pile of rags remained, and the bloody wounds on Yada's back. And that is the end of chapter four, book lovers. I hope you're still enjoying Ocean Eyes. Thank you so much for listening. I will be back next week with a new episode. And until next time, keep reading.